some of you may remember the great championship in boxing, the one that was never really fought. Sonny Liston was on the ground, and the then Cassius Clay, who then became known as Muhammad Ali, had this great ritornello. I am the greatest! And he was determined to represent his people that the black people could win in all things and get equal rights. Remember, it was a battle in the 60s which could actually cost blood. Witness Martin Luther King. Yesterday, I was at the other end of the spectrum, the little ones of this world. Sometimes there are hidden gems and great surprises. A little child came to the sacristy to serve, and as he always does, he jumps straight into my arms, wants a big kiss and then gets dressed, and also says his prayers before he's getting dressed. He's been taught to do that. But before he did anything then, he actually got on his knees and asked me to say a prayer over him. Will you please ask Jesus to give me the grace never to say no? <laughs> Wow! Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise. There is a beauty in simplicity and the unaware greatness of a child, the person who's not knowing that he's a gem. A girl who grows up at the age of adolescence starts to become aware that she's interesting and she can have a bad reaction. From being like that, they can suddenly become like this. Is it not familiar? There's nothing new under the sun. I remember one time in Italy, Dad was with a group of children because he was head of languages in school and would always have these trips on the continent to Italy and Germany, languages he was teaching. So we had these sixth formers, and I remember hearing my mother talking to the headmaster's wife, saying, such and such a lassie is very beautiful, but ma'am added straight away, pity she knows it. I make a jump. Therese could have ended up in complete oblivion, like any other normal hidden nun. Providence had other views. I make another thing jump in parenthesis. It's the fact that as it happens, I got to know quite a lot about this, as it were, virtual neighbour, because for a long time I was close to Les Yeux at La Trappe. And it just happened that our abbot was very keen on her spirituality and in chapter would very often make reference to her. Moreover, he invited the then world expert on her to give her our annual retreat one year, which in France means very serious stuff for eight days. The standards are high. So we had the inside story. There was nothing he didn't know about this hidden gem. I'll come to that in a second. But not before another little aside, it's this. In my first contact with La Trappe in 1974, I was 20 at the time, and went there for the summer, I would be next sometimes in prayer to Frère Marie Bernard. He was then an old monk, and I was a young man, so we're jumping here generations. And he, although one doesn't get to know a Trappist, at least at the time it was like that, we only spoke by sign languages, the way in which one is close to a soul who's close to God rubs off, and one gets the message of what sanctity is. He was a good man, but he was also very gifted. First of all, the good man side of him, he was the spiritual brother or father to Sister Agnes, that's the Pauline of the life of Therese, who comes in often as the one who kind of was a second mother to her on every level. And actually her psychological illness at home might have been linked with her departure for the Carmel. They were inseparable. But anyway, 
This was ongoing while she was alive, but before she died she asked Frère Marie Bernard if he would burn all the correspondence. It was too secret and too private. So he complied with her wishes and all has gone up in smoke. No only unto Jesus. But this same Frère Marie Bernard was also fairly keen on her sister in the sense that he had also this interior link with her. He was a very gifted monk and he was a very good sculptor. So he did big sculptures, one of which was Notre Dame de la Confiance, which was over the hill overlooking La Trappe as a thanksgiving offering for the miraculous protection of the whole monastery during the whole débarquement and bombardement of Normandie, which was very close to where it was all happening, D-Day. And it was miraculously preserved from any bombshell. It was a huge statue, and underneath it he put Ipsa Protegente Non Timebis, which is from St. Bernard of Clairvaux, with her protecting, you'll have nothing to fear. But then he went on to do another important sculpture, the one that then went round the world, which you would have seen in practically any Catholic church in Ireland. The statue of Therese with the rose, or roses, and the crucifix. The classical one, it's his work, the original. Okay, I close that little parenthesis, but I get on now to what we learned in these eight days of listening to the world expert on Thérèse of Lisieux. There's more to her than meets the eye. And it's for just, not just for one reason that she made a doctorate of the church, because actually you've got in her a whole spirituality of the interior life and also of monastic life specifically. The way that she's got known is through that little way of trusting simplicity, la vie la confiance. But the actual way of executing charity in the community is also something which we looked at very, very carefully. And it's something which applies also in a family. It's this. We have a choice in our relationships between two ways of handling the same issue. There will be, in our life, people who will irritate us. There will be situations in which we can succeed or fail on the test. Now, she could have, for a period not of months but of years, yielded to that just out-of-control moment of reaction to the nun who had the great gift of displeasing her in all. She was brilliant at being annoying. And he went into detail about how it was done. Try to pray the rosary against a concert of fidgeting. It's not easy. Multiply that by 24-7 within the same walls all the time in a small area and try to live your whole life without ever letting on to the person herself or to anyone else that there's the slightest bad vibe. It's heroic. She did it. She conquered. And one day after her death, one priest was hearing the confession of the nun in question, and by then they had read her life, and this nun herself was curious when talking to the priest, who on earth could that sister have been? And what was her shock when he said, Ma sœur, c'était vous! All those years, she hadn't picked up a single vibe. That is close to home, if we're honest. We have a choice. Somebody comes at us. Somebody puts us down. What will be our reaction? The same tone? The game that that person is playing? or another. It's heroic sanctity out of the little things. And as in the case of Therese, if it's completely successful, it won't be noticed. It's the heroic sanctity of the invisible. One saint put it thus, Je me méfie de l'humilité 
qui se montre. Protestations of humility if somebody praises us. And yet, that person is be bubbling with pride if ever that person is put down. But then, he went on to describe also things that had happened, not only during her life, but afterwards. And this was his own research, which few actually therefore would have known about. She's been very much around and about after her death. And he would quote us stories like this that he knew about. In India, some poor lady was in dire straits. The family was at its wit's end. They were starving and there was no housing. And yet, with India, things are as they are. They sort of function. But nevertheless, she was going to try to get something from the authorities and queued in this waiting room for an audience with somebody who had power. She went in expecting yet another no. And what was her surprise when the person behind the desk said, well, as it happens, a nun just came in before you and actually she was talking about your case and explained a few things to me and I thought, well, maybe she's right. I might actually help this lady. I don't know. She, she had, she was dressed, this brown thing on. And then, eventually, somehow, he was shown a picture of Thérèse of Lisieux, of whom he knew nothing, not even being a Christian. It may have been something that she was carrying on her person that dropped out of a book she was reading. Ah! That's the one! Do you realise, sir, that she's dead these 50 years? And on he would go with such stories which no one ever knew about. And do you know how she started to get known? It's through that manuscript actually leaking out of it. That manuscript which had been written under obedience to Mother Agnes, Sister Pauline, and the initial reaction was, oh, put it there in the drawer. And as this good retreat master said, the best seller of the 20th century was put in the drawer to collect dust for a good long time. Who would have had the slightest intimation of its power to explode one day? And so, in the beginning of the 1900s, not that long after her death, it was perceived that this hidden Carmelite had power of intercession. So much so, that it was getting to the ears of one or two bishops in France and also, strangely enough, to the virile elements of the French army. And she became very popular because people had noticed that when they were invoking her, they were protected and things started to happen. So quite a few soldiers were carrying pictures of Thérèse de la Sainte Face, as she was often called, with a picture of the Holy Face. But it was that one, it was Thérèse, not yet even beatified. And one bishop was approached one day as the war was starting by a certain young cleric who had tried his vocation at Les Reins, a very strict Cistercian monastery, and couldn't take it because his health wasn't sufficient. And so he applied to become a priest. And this bishop ordained him and he had to be called up and go to the war. But the bishop did this. He made a pact with the one he was fond of in heaven, Thérèse of Lisieux. Garde-moi celui-ci, j'en ai besoin. Keep him, I need him. So off he went with himself, and after a while the soldiers noticed something. He was jumping from one trench to the other, anointing left, right and centre dying soldiers and morsels of men, crying out in agony. Not one was left to die without the sacraments. But the notion was that normally he should have died after the first few anointings. That was the normal fate of quite a few of these chaplains. But what was the surprise of the soldiers when they noticed that every single time he was around in the open fire, the bullets were, yes, 
going right round him each time and never touching him. It was just humanly impossible. So he carried on with his ministry and anointed a huge number of soldiers. He got back to the bishop and the bishop said, well done, now there's something I've got to tell you. I had asked Therese of Lisieux to keep you, and here you are again. So off he went with himself and found Les Enfants Apprentis Apprenti de Arteuil, where he is now remembered as a blessed. He was beatified with another Carmelite, actually, Elizabeth of the Trinity, in 1985, roughly. This, then, was the beginning of her being known, which explains how quickly she was canonized, already in 1925, and how, because of her interest in the missions, she had a spiritual brother out in the missions, she was made co-patron of the missions along with François Xavier, which, by the way, is interesting in this family, with Xavier there doing also care of the sick. And, of course, recently in time, one of the only three women doctors of the church. One is actually another Carmelite, Therese to Teresa of Avila and St. Catherine of Siena along with her, who were made doctor of the church by Blessed Paul VI in 1970. But it was because precisely of the amount of influence that her spirituality had had and exercised over the whole mystical body. It's something humanly inexplicable. Where does that leave us? I'd say that one thing we can take with us, it's not to spend our life insisting that I am the greatest, but to see the beauty of hiddenness and not to want any other referee but Jesus, lover of souls. Mm -hmm.